started. It's a pleasure to have now uh, Alessandro Pavan speaking about differential taxation and occupational choice. 40 minutes, Alessandro, and then Vitor Farinha will discuss. Ah, okay. Well, while we wait for the slides, so let me take uh, the opportunity to thank the organizers. Uh, um, so it's a great pleasure to be uh, here today. So uh, this is joint work with uh, um, Renato Gomez uh, uh, and uh, Jean-Marie Dotsuch Moore, uh, both from uh, Toulouse. Um, so it's a project about uh, taxation, uh, and uh, for those of you who were in uh, Sao Paulo um, last week, um, so it, it, it shares with the work that I've presented uh, on, uh, on Saturday, uh, the idea that the taxation uh, is largely driven by redistribution considerations in a world with asymmetric information, but then the two angles are completely different. In the paper that I presented on Saturday, I was looking at the dynamics. Uh, here I'm considering a completely static uh, problem but where um, productivity is multidimensional and is sector specific, so when you design a tax code, you take into account not just how you're going to affect uh, the supply of labor, but also how you induce agents to sort themselves over different occupations. So that's the key um, distinction between the two papers. So in uh, taxation theory, uh, there are two uh, fundamental results that uh, shape the intellectual debate on how to structure optimally uh, the tax code. So one is the Diamond and Merlis theorem, and the other is the Atkinson and Stiglitz uh, theorem. So the Diamond and Merlis theorem establishes the optimality of production efficiency. So essentially it establishes that if a government has a rich set of instruments, so if you're not exogenously constrained in your way of designing the, the code, then uh, you may distort uh, labor supply, you may distort, uh, of course, consumption, but uh, you should not uh, mess it up when it comes to production efficiency. What does that mean? It means that for a given amount of inputs, there should not be a reallocation of inputs across uh, sectors, for example, that permits you to produce more. The other key result in uh, taxation theory goes under the name of Atkinson and Stiglitz, which established that uh, if you have uh, sophisticated income taxes, and uh, if preferences are separable in the utility of consumption and disutility of labor, which is the canonical assumption which is made uh, not just in taxation but also in managerial compensation theory, then uh, you should not use sale taxes. Well, so why, why do you care? So why do you care about each of these two results? A lot because the combination of the two provides uh, an intellectual ground to justify, for example, uh, uh, the, for opposing taxation of intermediate goods but also for opposing, to a large extent, the capital taxation, but also opposing differential sales taxes and sector-specific income tax deductions. So there's a there's very intense political debate on uh, you know, how to structure taxes, and in particular how to structure not just income taxes, but the combination between income sales and capital taxes. And these two theorems uh, are you know, the cornerstone for opening up the debate about how to structure things. And uh, as you can imagine, you know, they are highly influential, uh, not just among uh, academics, uh, but uh, also about uh, policymakers for good or bad reasons. So what uh, um, we do in, uh, in this paper is uh, we consider in, uh, in what in our eyes is the national enrichment of uh, the intellectual debate that takes into account that agents are fair in uh, the productivity in a sector-specific manner. So if you ask me you know, how costly it is for me to generate income by being an economist and you, and you compare that uh, how costly it would be to generate the same income by you know, doing snowboarding, probably it would be lower to do snowboarding, but I made a mistake and I became an economist. But the important thing is uh, you know, that people are really different in the ability to generate income across sectors. And when you can take that into account, then actually what uh, we show is that actually both theorems uh, turn out to be overturned. So you establish the failure of a diamond Merlis theorem, showing that actually production inefficiency is a robust and generic property of optimal tax codes, and that will define genericity in an appropriate manner. We also establish a failure of the Atkinson Stiglitz theorem, showing that if, for political considerations, uh, it's impossible to lay the income taxes in a sector-specific manner, suppose that the government doesn't permit you to do so, you know, you cannot tax engineers differently from you the way you tax, uh, you know, income generating in, uh, in, uh, in other sectors, then actually, uh, 
um, input tax, uh, commodity or input taxes become optimal. So the redundancy of sale taxes disappear. From a theoretical standpoint, the contribution here is in developing a new methodology for solving multidimensional screening problems with a combination of intensive uh, and extensive margin. So the literature is a bit, uh, you know, too broad for me to go into details. Uh, um, here I'm just focusing on uh, the debate about uh, taxation in connection to occupational choice. NATO was the first one to show that actually production inefficiency uh, may be desirable if uh, you have occupational choice, but he considered a case where occupational choice is not really you know, a choice variable in the sense that either you're skilled or, or you're unskilled and you can just you know, switch from one to the other. And then following up, Saez showed that actually if you look at the long run and if people can uh, decide whether to become skilled or unskilled, then production efficiency is restored. The closest uh, to our work uh, is a work by Rothschild and, uh, and Schur. Uh, they consider uh, a ROI model similar to ours, but they impose uniform taxation. They don't permit the government, either directly or indirectly through sales taxes, to essentially manipulate the way allocate, agents allocate across sectors. And by implication, uh, of course, they obtain a production efficiency. Um, OK, so let me move on because time is limited. Uh, so I'm going to set up the model then establish some preliminaries about characterization of uh, incentive compatible allocations for this multidimensional screening problem, um, characterize the optimal tax code in an environment where the government permits you to use income specific, uh, uh, excuse me, sector specific uh, income taxes, and then uh, impose a what I think of as a political economy restriction, which says it's supposed that actually you cannot tax income in a differentiated manner depending on the sector, and then I show how you can play with sales taxes and, uh, um, and do better than what you could have done uh, uh, by um, forcing yourself to production efficiency. And then I will conclude. So here's the model. So um, the economy is populated by unit mass continuum of agents, and there are two sectors, A and B. The productivity of an agent uh, in uh, sector J is given by NJ, that's an element of an interval, a possibly unbounded interval, so as to accommodate some of the distribution that people want to work with in uh, public economics. And the agent type is the collection of his productivity in each of the two sectors. Okay? Types are drawn uh, in ID manner from a distribution F with a support uh, N. Um, I'm going to rule out uh, mass points, so F is absolute continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Fj will be the marginal with respect to the J dimension. Fj given K, the condition. Okay. So agents with productivity Nj supplying H Hj hours in sector J generates uh, uh, Nj times Hj of effective labor. So this is, again, it's, it's a jargon uh, imported from uh, PF. What differentiates effective labor from income is that income is obtained by the amount of effective labor that you produce times the wage rate that you get. So think of uh, uh, HJ is the number of hours that Muhammad works per day, NJ is his productivity, the product of the two is the number of firms he, he proves per day, and uh, Omega J is how much uh, MIT pays per theorem. Okay? So that's his uh, per day income. So the tax system comprises uh, uh, two functions and two scalars. Uh, the functions TJ describes how much uh, income is taxed in sector J. And uh, no restrictions are imposed, so it could be you know, non-linear, it could have uh, all sorts of possible discontinuities, uh, you know, kink points, and, uh, and you name it. Tau J, these are the sales tax on, on good J. Okay, so that's a component of the tax code that is linear and which comes from the sales of the good as opposed to the income itself. If uh, you were to impose uniform uh, income taxation, that would correspond to say that uh, this function TA has to be the same across the two sectors. So you, you cannot tax income generated in Silicon Valley in a way that is different from the income which is generating Wall Street, as long as is labor income. Of course, you can always uh, tax uh, uh, capital gains in a different manner. Another application of this model, but the one that I presumably I won't have time to talk uh, about today, is one where one sector could be informal, 
which boils down to essentially saying that uh, you, know, you can't raise uh, you know, income taxes in that sector. You know, this is a black market. So you, there's no way you can go there and ask people to pay income taxes. However, you know, if you think that this black market in southern Italy, you know, presumably it has uh, a lot to do with the uh, production of a particular good, then what you could do is to try to affect the entire function of the economy by using sale taxes in, on that particular good. So that's another application of this methodology. So there could be political economy constraints that prevent you from raising income taxes in one particular sector. And then the question is, how do you set up the income tax in the sector that you can tax? And how do you bundle that with the appropriate sales taxes in order to do the best that you can? So um, let me now talk about the payoffs. An agent with type uh, N who decides to supply HJ hours in sector J gets a payoff which is equal to his income, net of how much taxes he pays, net of the disutility of, uh, of working. Okay, so that's the usual assumption of a sales that utility of money, of compensation, of consumption is separable in the disutility of, of working. For certain results, uh, I will uh, conveniently assume that the disutility of effort is isoelastic. That's the typical assumption made in this literature. I'm going to assume that uh, the production side uh, is described by what I, I did a moment ago. On the demand side, there's a classical firm with linear technologies. And for convenience here, I'm just dropping capital. There's nothing going on of interest uh, from the capital side. So just think of the amount of output produced as being equal to the amount of labor which is employed by the firm. So the firm profits is equal to the revenue that it makes minus how much you pay to the workers minus how much sales taxes you pay. So the reason for assuming a neoclassical uh, um, a uh, firm with uh, constant return to scale is, ex is by design is precisely to isolate the new effects that come from uh, the fact that agents here sort uh, themselves out across the two sectors instead of using other theory of possible uh, optimality of uh, occupational choice distortions that could come, for example, from spillovers between the two sectors or the fact that you, know, you may, as a government, dislike a lot one sector rather than the other one. We want to shut that down completely in order to give us a the highest possible chances of maintaining the Atkinson uh, um, Stiglitz and uh, the uh, Diamond Merlis uh, theorems and uh, essentially overturn these two key results in public uh, economics entirely by um, the, asymmetric of, uh, the symmetry of information. So an allocation here is specified as a collection of two functions. One is an occupational choice rule that describes how agents sort themselves over Silicon Valley and Wall Street as a function of their productivities, and then functions that specify how much they work once they join each of the two sectors. So I'm going to say that an allocation is implementable at the wage rates at W if I can construct a tax code that does the job. What does it mean that it does the job? Well, it means that it satisfies the following four properties. The first one is a consistency property that says that the level of productivities present in sector A, which is the domain of the labor supply function in sector A, coincides with a set of productivities for which I can find uh, an NB, a level of productivity in the other sector, such that an agent with this pair of productivity indeed end up working sector A. The second is an intensive margin uh, incentive compatibility constraint that says that the equilibrium payoff of someone with productivity NJ who decides to join sector J coincides with the value function, the maximum the agent could do by optimally choosing how much labor to supply. The third one is an extensive margin uh, constraint that says that if you join sector J, it's because it's optimal for you to do so. So the max you can uh, obtain, uh, given uh, you know, your bidimensional uh, type by working sector J, is higher than what you can obtain uh, by picking the other sector. And the last one is a production incentive compatibility constraint that says that the amount of labor employed by the firm is optimal from the perspective of the firm. So taxation equilibrium consists of an allocation along with it, uh, taxes and wages, such that the allocation is implementable at the given wages by the tax system, and the tax system satisfies some budget constraint, whatever that is. 
So the budget constraint simply says that you know, the amount of money that you raised uh, through income taxes and uh, through sales taxes has to exceed some threshold. And the threshold for me comes out of the blue. That's what uh, you know, the government uh, dictates. And that's what I have to collect. It could be determined in, in, in a general equilibrium model by uh, other considerations, including uh, the ability to raise debt by the government. This is, of course, it's beyond the, the scope of analysis. OK, so what's the planner's problem? Planner problems consist in finding a, a tax system that maximizes certain uh, uh, welfare function. So think of the indirect utility of an agent with multidimensional type uh, uh, N as the max that the agent can obtain by choosing optimally which sector to join. And then tilde takes into account that once you choose uh, a sector, you also, also optimally decide how much labor to supply. Then the planner chooses uh, an equilibrium in order to maximize either a Rolson objective, which con consists in uh, essentially giving all the weight to the agent with the lowest uh, productivity, or some concave utilitarian welfare function where you're weighting different utilities, or equivalently different agents, who have different weights. You know, these weights could be linear, could be non-linear, it, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's start by identifying uh, what the, uh, the government could do in, uh, in this econ economy. So I'm going to say that an allocation is implemented at wages uh, uh, W by the tax system uh, tau if and only if uh, the following two condition holds. So this is uh, an initial characterization of incentive compatibility. It better be the case that uh, for each sector, incomes are known decreasing. It's the usual monotonistic condition when applied to this environment. And payoffs have to satisfy this uh, uh, property, so the indirect utility of the agent has to be Lipschitz continuous, so that's a, it's not imposed, it's, it's a requirement of incentive compatibility. And uh, the speed by which your payoff changes with your type has to be related to your labor supply. And that's exactly the rate that uh, links the two. The second property of incentive compatibility is the one that pertains to the extensive margin. There must exist uh, an absolute continuous or weekly increasing threshold function with the property that uh, if this is your multidimensional type, you join a sector A if your productivity in sector B is low enough. And so that's, that's obvious. So the only thing that is not obvious is why the function has to be continuous uh, and weekly increasing. Or maybe, actually, even that should be obvious. But. Yeah. Over, over what? Which uh, you can, but the government will never gain it by inducing you to do it. At most, there could be a countable set of types for which the government uh, could create indifference, but then you know, this uh, randomization will not impact uh, welfare. Under the assumption of that there are no mass points. <clears throat> so here's the, the, um, the representation. So that's the, the threshold rule. Everyone whose productivity is in this region uh, joins sector A. Everyone who is in this region uh, joins sector B. What is production efficiency? The 45 degree line. So Diamond Merlis will say that you know, if your productivity is higher in Silicon Valley than in Wall Street, you should go to Silicon Valley. OK. Now, the, the next observation is that uh, once I take into account that the occupational choice uh, has to satisfy the optimality condition uh, dictated by incentive compatibility, then I should also observe that uh, the labor supply in one sector is really redundant. You know, what is redundant is that it's not really control. Once I determine how I want to sort agents across the two sectors, that's my C choice, and once I pick uh, the labor supply in sector A, then the labor supply in sector B is automatically determined by the other two policies. So the fact I have only two policies to play with. Okay. So the next thing to do is uh, to construct uh, the endogenous measure that corresponds to the distribution of productivities across the two sectors. And that's one of the you know, key distinctions of this paper with respect to previous work, including, for example, Schur and, uh, and, and Rothschild. So here, people remember that when you choose a tax uh, equilibrium, you're also endogenously allocating productivities over the two sectors. So I'm going to denote by GA as the measure of agents whose productivity is less than uh, NA induced by my occupational choice rule C. Something similar for sector B, but then I will conveniently work 
with this uh, transformation of this is uh, a joint measure that tells me what is the measure of agents uh, working in sector A with productivity less than an A plus the measure of agents working in sector B with productivity is less than C of an A. Remember that the C is the cutoff. is what determines how people are located themselves between the two sectors. So essentially this is a trick, it's, it's, a, this, it's an auxiliary measure that permits me to turn a multidimensional problem into a unidimensional one. So the picture here is meant just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, this is not the representation of the measure, of course. It's just, you know, where the measure essentially have a byte. It's who I'm, uh, so who I'm describing. So G of an A of a C is the measure of agents working in sector A whose productivity is uh, at most equal to NA. Okay, so the corresponding density will correspond to the density illustrating this segment. Likewise for sector B. And then this fictitious auxiliary measure is what to describe whoever is working in each of the two sectors will probably be less than an A in one sector and C of an A in the other sector. That corresponds to the measure that you assign to this uh, rectangle. So when I will move an A, take into account uh, the occupational choice C, de facto will move the measure of people who allocate themselves <laughs> over both sectors. So that's a way of essentially turning uh, two measures into a single one. So how do you solve now for the optimal uh, equilibrium? So the typical approach is that uh, you take a nuclear bomb, you put it on a rocket, you shoot on the mosquitoes, and you declare a mission accomplished. Okay, so that's optimal control. So the other um, approach that uh, you can follow, uh, ultimately has to be consistent with the former, is to identify appropriate uh, perturbations of whatever you claim to be optimal, but don't improve upon what you're proposing to be optimal, and nonetheless, we permit you to identify the key economic properties of interest. So I'm going to follow the, the latter approach, but of course, you know, I'm not really cheating, so what I claim to be uh, a variational approach that uh, vindicates my properties as being consistent with optimality can also be established with a nuclear bomb. So if you prefer a nuclear bomb, you can always set it up. So the characterization procedure here, and with some methodological contribution that I'm uh, uh, attached to, or you know, who cares, so maybe I can go and I'm attached to it, is to set up a primal dual approach that really permits you to identify what you care in terms of key economic properties. So the primal approach takes the occupational choice rule as given. Suppose that I don't have any control on the occupational choice rule. When I say that, I don't mean that I can control how agents allocate themselves over the two sectors. So it has to be the case that whatever I do by setting up my tax code respects this occupational choice as an equilibrium outcome. So remember that I cannot force people to work uh, in, uh, in Wall Street or in Silicon Valley. People do allocate themselves based on what is good for them. But then what I do is uh, I look at a taxation equilibrium that does the best for me, so maximize my objective, subject to the constraint that the government asks me to implement this particular occupational choice rule. So notice that this primal problem could also be of interest to you if, for example, if for political consideration, you want to favor one sector over the other. Okay? Suppose that you know, the government dictates that you know, it better be the case that the measure of people working in Wall Street is not too high. So in, according to whatever restriction, uh, it could justify that, uh, that imposition. Then the primal could still be useful for you for that. The dual, the dual takes as given labor supply in one of the two sectors, let's say sector A. And then it derives the best taxation equilibrium under the constraint that uh, whoever works in sector A supplies labor according to what is specified by this function. But for example, one of the objectives of the dual is to determine how people allocate themselves over the two sectors. Everything, of course, has to be consistent with a taxation equilibrium. And remember, the taxation equilibrium in its definition has both incentive compatibility but also the budget uh, constraint uh, that the government may impose on you as a designer. An X optimal taxation equilibrium has to solve both the primal and the dual. So the policies of the labor supply and the tax policies uh, that uh, constitute opt an optimal uh, um, equilibrium have to solve the primal and the occupational choice and the other labor supply in the remaining sector together with the tax system have to solve the dual. So you know, this is an obvious observation that it says that whenever you have more than one control, you can always look at the joint optimality by decomposing it into a primal and the dual. There's nothing really particular in, uh, in what I'm saying. It's just the way now we solve the two problems by invoking the 
appropriate the perturbations is what will permit me to identify the right economic properties. So because I'm going to talk about uh, Diamond and Merlis, I have to define what I mean by production efficiency for this economy. An equilibrium exhibits production efficiency if and only if holding fixed labor supply of each worker, there exists no reallocation of workers across sectors that yields higher aggregate output. And that, of course, is consistent with incentive compatibility. So that's what it means to have production efficiency. There's no way you can just reallocate inputs across sectors and increase total output. Okay, so the first observation, how am I doing on time? Uh, 16 minutes. 16, yeah. okay. So the first observation is that, uh, you know, if a government doesn't impose political economy constraints on me, then I can forget about sales taxes. No, I already have enough instruments in the non-linear design of income taxes, but you know, what, what do I gain with sales taxes? You know? So the first observation is that I start with any equilibrium uh, that uh, has sales taxes, I can construct another tax system where sales taxes are equal to zero, wages are equal to one, and I do everything that I need to do directly with income taxes. Now let me tackle the, the primal uh, uh, problem. So by tackling the primal problem, essentially what I uncover is the generalization of Merlis to a multidimensional sector economy. So the generalization of Merlis says that you know, when you look at the uh, uh, marginal taxes across sectors, they have to satisfy this optimality condition. So what this optimality condition is saying is, in essence, that uh, you're trading off two things. You're trading off the fact that if you were to raise uh, taxes in one sector, you would get uh, a direct benefit of being able to collect more resources from that sector, which you could then use, if you're Rolstein, for example, to trans by transferring these resources to the guy who's the poorest in society. If you're not Rolstein, mm -hmm. then this direct benefit of increasing on the margin taxes at a certain level uh, of income level should also take into account that if you raise taxes, you're going to make everyone whose productivity is higher than the cutoff where you're raising taxes. And how much you care about the utility of these agents is what is determined by this uh, indicator function ICU. So that's the benefit of taxes. Why do you tax? Well, because you want to collect resources. What are the two costs that you have to take into account at the margin? Is that people are smart. When you tax them, uh, when you change the tax code, they change the labor supply. Now the contribution here is in relating exactly the elasticity effect of labor supply in one sector to the elasticity of labor supply in the other sector once you constrain yourself to a particular occupational choice rule. So you give me the occupational choice rule, optimality requires that uh, for each level of income generated in sector A and the corresponding level of income generated by sector B by someone who's just indifferent between joining sector A when joining sector B, well, the elasticity effect across the two sectors have to combine according to this optimality condition. So here's the graphical illustration of who's affected by the direct effect and the elasticity effects. Take an agent with productivity NA and whose productivity in sector A and whose productivity in sector B is C of NA. This is someone who's just indifferent between going to one sector or the other. Suppose that you were to raise a little bit of a marginal tax that you apply to the income level corresponding to this guy. Well, of course, if you increase the income level, the tax that you apply to this guy, then you, you change the amount of labor supply that this guy is going to provide. And of course, in order to implement the same occupational choice, remember that in the primal problem, occupational choice is dictated to you by the government. You have no control over it. Then you should change the tax code also in the other sector in order to take into account the variation in the supply of labor by the guy in the other sector. So these two areas essentially correspond to, the, correspond to people who are affected by the elasticity effects. People that belong to this other area are people who are affected by the direct effect. If you raise taxes at this income level, then for someone like Umberto, who's much more productive, you know, he's not going to change his labor supply. You know, nothing at the margin changes uh, from his uh, viewpoint. 
Well, everything is going to be worse off because if you raise the marginal tax here, you also raise the total tax that he's going to pay. So everyone here is directly affected by the variation in the tax code. And if you were to take someone whose productivity is above Umberto's level, this is someone who is extremely productive uh, in Silicon Valley. This is a very good entrepreneur, very poorly productive as a trader. You know, he doesn't get any utility by looking at the numbers all the day. You know, and it, so this is someone who works in sector A, no matter what his productivity in sector B. So for someone here, there's no extensive margin consideration. So not surprisingly, you're back to Merlis. That's exactly Merlis formula. It's an awful formula, but that's what it is. It simply tells you that the elasticity effect should be matched to the direct effect. Benefits should equal uh, cost. Now, one nice observation is that uh, in a model with occupational choices, and that's a key distinction with respect to Merlis, it's not the one that emphasized at the beginning, though. Marginal tax rates could be negative. You could have subsidies at certain income levels. That cannot be in Merlis. If you really wanted to convince people not to go to Wall Street, it, must, it might be the case that you know, your occupational choice rule that you want to implement is so much demanding that the only way you can induce people to go to Silicon Valley, if you think that that's desirable, is to essentially subsidize people in, in Silicon Valley. And this is just an example. You can apply to your sector of, uh, of you know, of preferred choice. So you could have negative uh, marginal tax rates at certain occupational choice levels. Okay. Now I wanted to solve the, the dual, and that's where the excitement comes from, for me at least. All right, so, it's, uh, so the, the primal you could also have uh, established it with a nuclear bomb. The, the dual it's where it requires a little bit of more of uh, creativity. So. The way we're going to arrive to the, you know, what in the jargon of optimal control theory is called an all our condition, is by identifying a, a classes of reforms that we call alpha payroll tax reform. What is an alpha payroll tax reform? It's, it's a reform of a tax system that is very simple. It says that if you take people working in sector B and take any income below a certain cutoff, pick whatever cutoff you want, then an alpha payroll tax reform works as follows. Under the reform, how much someone is going to pay, it's equal to a fixed percentage alpha at 20% of your income, plus on the remaining 80% of your income, you're going to be taxed exactly as you were taxed before the reform. So very simple, actually. This is something you can even explain it to people in, uh, in Washington. Okay. So the nice observation here is what happens uh, when you implement uh, an alpha payroll tax reform. And for something to be optimal, it must be the case that there is no one from Washington who can envision an alpha, pay an alpha payroll tax reform that does better compared to whatever you're proposing to be optimal. So the nice observation is the following. Take someone who's affected by the reform. In, our one, in other words, someone whose income is below the cutoff for which the reform applies. Well, look at how, what's the utility of this agent when he provides uh, a certain number of hours of, of labor. How much he gets, it's exactly how much uh, a friend of his with productivity one minus alpha of his own productivity would have obtained before the reform. So that means that uh, how much of this guy is going to work after the reform is implemented it's equal to the amount of labor that would have been supplied by his friend before the reform. His friend is someone whose productivity is 1 minus alpha, his own productivity. And likewise, his utility after the reform, it's equal to the utility of his friend before the reform. But that means that uh, the relationship with establishing difference once the reform is implemented is that uh, the, the rule, the occupational choice rule, it's just 1 over 1 minus alpha, the old occupational choice rule. So let's now investigate as economists. I suppose I have no clue about optimal control. Actually, unfortunately, my kindergarten teacher you know, taught me a little bit about making design, but nothing about optimal control. So uh, let's try to think about in economics of what can happen if I implement an alpha um, payroll tax reform. The first thing that I ask myself is, in terms of utility, how do things change? Well, 
because they're just identifying the relevant equivalence between payoffs after the reform and payoffs before the reform. Now I ask myself, what happens if I change alpha and evaluate everything at alpha equal to zero? That's in the language of uh, you know, variational arguments, optimal control. That's what it means to envision a perturbation starting uh, from something which is deemed to be optimal. Well, the marginal impact on uh, someone whose productivity is NB is just proportional to how much before the reform his payoff was varying with his type times his productivity. But how much his payoff was changing with his type is what is determined by incentive compatibility. There was no, you know, it itself was pinned down by the labor supply and by the original tax code. Now I take into account that if I implement the alpha reform, everyone whose productivity is below C of an A is going to be affected. So what's the total effect on welfare of implementing the reform? Well, that's exactly what I have here. But now I say, well, what, what do you mean? It's quite, and welfare is not the only thing, right? So you also care about the taxes. So now I thing to take into account is that this is how much revenue I obtain uh, from the reform. Well, now let me investigate what is the marginal impact on revenue of implementing the reform starting from no reform, alpha equal to zero. And then I define, again, I integrate over everyone who's affected, and that's what I call my revenue collection effect. Revenue collection effect, it takes into account that if I, if I implement a reform, I change the amount of money that I bring to Washington. What's the third effect? Well, migration. Now that I implement a reform, some people move from Wall Street to Silicon Valley. Why do I care about the migration? Well, because when people move, the amount of taxes that they collect changes. Again, you can use this uh, fictitious measure that I was describing in the beginning to compute exactly what is the migration effect. And the last effect, it's really the boring one. It's the fact I have to deal with incentive compatibility, unfortunately. Incentive compatibility doesn't permit me to have any discontinuity in, in payoffs. So that, that cannot be. So there's a continuity correction that has to come from the fact that, you know, payoff of someone who is just before the cutoff where the reform applies has to have a payoff equal to someone who is just above the cutoff for which the reform applies. So that requires introdu introducing a lump sum to compensate for the alpha payroll reform and preserve incentive compatibility. No, no, glo global, the old they're all part of analysis, but uh, all of this, uh, actually, you can establish uh, by looking at only at uh, the uh, necessary condition. Because any system, so, you know, you're, you're the challenger, I'm the defender. So I propose uh, a tax system that uh, is incentive compatible and uh, generates a certain welfare. Now, you're the challenger, so you come and you say, look, uh, I do the alpha. So the alpha preserves incentive compatibility. The alpha payroll tax reform combined with this uh, correction preserve global incentive compatibility. So for me to be able to defend myself, it better be the case of that, uh, you know, you cannot do better. <clears throat> okay, and now here's the other condition. That's it. So that's what you would have established with a nuclear bomb. Welfare effect has to be equal to revenue collection effect plus migration effect and the lump sum which is needed for uh, uh, preserving incentive compatibility. The continuity correction effect. That's exactly what optimality requires. So for something to be optimal, it has to be the case that the properties of the marginal taxes encoded into the tax system have to satisfy this condition. That's it. Well, it depends what you want to get out of it. For what I want to get out of it, that's enough. So this is an optimality condition. Yeah, but typically as it is the case you know, with variational arguments, there are many optimality conditions you can, uh, you can envision. I wanted to do two things. I want to establish that uh, diamond release doesn't hold for this environment in a generic sense. So just take an and that's enough. Condition. Yeah. No, that's enough. Okay, so let me skip this picture. Now let me call, uh, uh, le now I want to talk about uh, diamond release and that I will uh, use it the last two minutes and then I will conclude. I'm going to say that uh, a distribution of productivity is non-generic if there exists a scalar delta such that this condition holds. For each n in one sector, the 
density of people uh, in that sector with this productivity times the conditional distribution of people who have a productivity less than n starting from n in that sector, it's just a scaling delta of what happens in the other sector. So symmetric distribution is non-generic. This defines a particular form of symmetry, which is definitely non-generic. So everything that satisfies this property is, is being non-generic. So take a taxation equilibrium. If the distribution is generic, then necessarily production efficiency fails. So unless you are in a knife edge case uh, where you know, everything is symmetric across the two sectors in the sense that I gave a moment ago, if not, then you will have a positive uh, Lebesgue measure subset of types. Actually, this is a bad way of saying it. It's a positive measure set of types, but of course you can go from one to the other, for which, uh, uh, excuse me, I misspoke, actually, it's the right condition. You have a positive measure, a positive Lebesgue measure set of types for which the cutoff is different from the one induced by the 45 degree line. So when you translate it in economic properties, this means that there is a positive measure set of individuals who are induced to join the sector in which they are less productive. They would be more productive to work in Wall Street, but the government with a tax code induced them to go to, Wall Street, to Silicon Valley. So remember the diamond Merlis theorem it says that uh, assume the government can levy differentiated taxes on all input and outputs. This is satisfied in our environment. Then production efficiency obtains. So what's the key assumption of that uh, permits us to overturn diamond Merlis? Asymmetric information combined with occupational choice. And both assumptions seem uh, fairly reasonable when it comes to uh, the design of tax codes. How many minutes do I have? Zero. Mm. One. One. So let me use the 60 seconds uh, at my disposal just to talk about uh, what happens if now the government is not so permissive. And the government says, you know what? There's no way I can convince uh, Congress to tax income uh, into different sectors in different ways. Say, so, fine. Then I'm going to do the following. I'm going to now reintroduce sales taxes. Of course, sales taxes being linear, I won't be able to do exactly the same that I could have done if I could have levied income, sector-specific income taxes. So there's going to be a constraint on me now. And actually, the particular constraint is that uh, now, you know, the only type of occupational choice rule that I can implement with sales taxes are linear cutoff rules. And in general, I may prefer to do non-linear stuff. This is not linear taxes. This is linear occupational choice rules. But then I can still uh, do something similar to what I did in, uh, in the general case, except that now I constrain myself to linear rules. But linear rules are always implementable with alpha payroll tax reforms. So all this machinery of the alpha payroll tax reforms, I can still apply it to the case where the government constrains me to use uh, uniform um, income taxes. And then, uh, you know, what I establish is, is, again, that at the optimum, I will induce, for a positive measure set of individuals, I will induce them to join the sector in which the productivity is not the highest. But in so doing, indirectly, I also establish the uh, failure of the atkinson stiglitz theorem. This theorem says that whenever utility of consumption is separable from this utility of labor, no reason to use sales taxes. Well, here I show the opposite, is that uh, sales taxes are strictly needed if I want to distort occupational choices. In essence, why do I want to distort occupational choices? Well, because that's what permits me to economize on redistribution. Starting from a, a benchmark of efficiency in occupational choices, if I distort a little bit the way people allocate themselves over the two sectors, I incur only a second order loss in terms of occupational efficiency, but a first order gain in terms of the cost of redistribution. I make myself, my life much easier when it comes to providing incentives to the agents to reveal the productivity in each of the two sectors. So the conclusion is, you know, what um, we did here, we uh, provided general treatment of differential taxation together with occupational choice. You know, if you're a little bit nerdish, you may have appreciated, uh, you know, the absence of nuclear bombs. That's the primal dual approach. It uncovers this generalized Merlis formula that uh, has the economic property of indicating that uh, if you really want to induce people to stop going to Wall Street, you may actually need to use the subsidies on, uh, on uh, the other sector. The other equation uh, that we identify is obtained with these alpha payroll tax reforms that I think have its own beauty inside. 
and the uncovers of the presence of these effects as the drivers of optimality. Migration effect, welfare effect, revenue collection, and continuity effects. The theorems that we establish show that uh, Diamond Merlis and Atkinson Stiglitz need not hold if uh, you have uh, economies with asymmetric information and occupational choices. And I really want to finish by saying that uh, this uh, approach that we develop in this paper could also be applied to other multidimensional screening problems. What makes uh, the analysis different from the one in Rocher or in Armstrong is that here you cannot hold the two professions at the same time. You really have to choose. Either you go to Wall Street or to Silicon Valley. So when it comes, for example, to monopolistic screening problems, there are environments where you cannot buy two homes. You have to buy only one. You don't have money for two homes at the same time. But you do have private information on how much you value an apartment relative to a single family house. So the techniques we develop in this paper also apply to other problems in screening with multidimensional types, but where you combine an intensive margin, in this model was labor supply, with an extensive margin, which is the choice of which occupation. In Musa Rosen, the intensive margin would be how much quantity you buy. The extensive margin is what type of, uh, of product you select to start with. So the techniques developed in this model could also be applied to this more general uh, multidimensional screening with uh, rivalry goods. Actually, I have one more slide. Hello, thank you all for being here. Uh, I would like to thank Vinicius and Umberto for organizing this uh, great workshop. And I would like to thank Alessandro for writing such an interesting paper for me to read. Um, discussing this paper, I thought it would be nice to go over, over a couple of simplifying and almost trivial examples that helped me understanding the driving forces behind the main results of the paper and suggested a couple questions that I'd like to see the answers to. Quick summary. So in this paper, they consider the problem of optimal taxation in a two-sector Y model. And agents are privately informed about their productivities in both sectors. So we have a two-dimensional mechanism design problem. And the main results in the paper are, first, that we have a failure of the diamond mirrorless theorem that states that in the optimal tax system, we should leave production undistorted. So in this simplifying model, undistorted production means that labor should be allocated to the task in which it's most, it's most productive. And they show that this is not necessarily optimal. Second, we have a failure of the atkinson Siglitz theorem that says that sales taxes are useless in the presence of rich enough income taxes. And they showed that under the realistic assumption that we, can, we cannot contingent income taxes on the sector choices of agents, we, have optimal, we can optimally use sales taxes. So let me start with the first example. What I'm doing in the first example is I'm shutting down private information in one of the sectors. So in sector A, agents are privately informed about their productivity just in the less than the original model. While in sector B, everyone has the same productivity and B. So there's no private information in sector B. So in this case, the job allocation rule, the sector allocation rule, is going to be described purely by a threshold. This threshold defines how productive you are in sector A, so that you end up going to that sector. And so the question is, what is the optimal choice of taxes and the threshold function? And I'm assuming without loss that we don't use sales taxes in this example. Okay. First, there will be no distortion in sector B because there's no private information in sector B. In sector A, we're going to have owner production for the usual reasons understood in the, from the taxation literature a long time ago, that by increasing the labor from a worker that is, has productivity in the middle of the distribution, I need to make everyone more productive than him happier, and this is bad for redistribution. I forgot to mention I'm considering the Rawlsian problem throughout the presentation. And finally, the optimal threshold is going to satisfy this first order condition that describes the marginal benefit from increasing the threshold a little bit. If I increase the threshold a little bit, I'm going to be pushing agents towards sector B that has no private information. So I'm going to, I'm going to gain the surplus that's productive, produ produced in sector B, but I'm going to be losing the surplus that is produced in sector A at the threshold level. If we start from the efficient threshold, this first, tr first difference is going to be positive because we have efficient level of production in sector B, while we have underproduction in sector A. We have also an extra positive effect 
from pushing agents towards sector B in which there's no private information. This is due to the fact that in sector A, what we're doing is we're removing the bottom of the distribution of productivities. This allows us to re extract more rents from the productive agents in sector A, which is good for redistribution. So the consequence of this is that the optimal threshold is going to be strictly higher than NB, which would be the full information threshold or the no distortion threshold in this simple model. So this example taught me, taught me is that allocating jobs in sector A is bad for two reasons. First, because production is inefficient in sector A. And second, because sector A has information rents due to private information. So this hurts redistribution. I think what is nice about this very simple example is that it not only tells me that production efficiency is not optimal, but it also tells me in what direction things are going to be distorted. So I think it would be nice to have a discussion on, in the paper of what are the properties of the distribution over productivity levels for a sector that would imply that that sector has a lower participation rate compared to the no distortion case. I think this could be done uh, at least in the independent types case that seems feasible. The first conjecture that came to my mind by looking at this example is that maybe looking at distributions that are ordered in terms of the hazard rate condition, we would be able to say something. But this is a very naive conjecture because even in the no distortion case, the relevant distribution accounts for the fact that agents end up in the sector in which they're most productive. So looking at this updated distribution sounds like a, a promising direction. I leave this as, a, as an open question for, for, for the authors, for specifically for Alessandro. The second example. In the second example, what I'm doing is I'm shutting down the sector of choice of the agents. So the population separated between agents that work in sector A and they're privately informed about their productivity in sector A and sector B, and they're privately informed about the productivity in that sector as well, but they cannot choose where to go. And F bar is going to be the average distribution of our productivities without conditioning on the specific sector. So in this example, I'm talking about sales taxes. So I'm going to assume that the tax authority has to continue, cannot use sector contingent income taxes. So it's going to use one uniform income tax for both sectors. but we have access to sales taxes. And notice that the important feature here is that the only way to design a tax system that's going to discriminate both sectors is by using sales taxes. So what is the optimum in this case, looking at the, from the Rawls and perspective as well? So first, let's call H bar and T bar the optimal location uh, when, we assume, when we restrict sales taxes to be zero. This is going to be the standard optimal location in the Mulesian model, looking at the average distribution in the population. So zero sales taxes are going to be optimal whenever this equation is true. What this equation says is that the marginal revenue from, increase, from creating sales taxes in sector A has to be equal to the marginal revenue from increasing sales taxes in sector B. So the first term is taken, to, is taken into account the fact that in, by increasing sales taxes, I'm going to appropriate a larger share of the average production. And the second term takes into account the behavioral responses of the agents, and I should say the epsilon is the elasticity of labor to the productivity level. So the integrand here is, 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 uh, is all, everything is calculated relative to the optimal for the average distribution in the population. So I'm being very informal here, but it's going to be rarely the case that for arbitrary distributions FA and FB, this equation is going to be true. So in general, we're going to have the optimality of the use of sales taxes. In the paper, uh, there is a very similar equation that's, that is equivalent to the optimality of zero sales taxes. However, it's adapted to, it's changed by looking at a different distribution that takes into account the fact that agents choose to go to the sector in which they're most productive in the low distortion case. This doesn't mean that the, so the result in this paper without sector choice doesn't mean that sector choice is irrelevant, but it does mean that in order to separate the effects of purely targeting income taxes to the distribution in each sector and the extra effects of the sector choice that is endogenous, we have to look at the actual level of the optimal sales taxes rather than just talking about the optimality of non-zero sales taxes. 
So uh, just to summarize, I think this is a very extremely interesting paper that revisits two of the most important results in taxation theory. Well, my main comments were that in the in the case of sector specific income taxes, it would be nicer it would be nice to have an idea of which sector is going to have lower participation relative to the no distortion case, and when we're looking at sector independent income taxes, to understand what is the distinction between a model without without endogenous uh, sector choice, in which sales taxes is just about tailoring the final tax to the actual distribution within each sector from a model that actually has sector choices. And finally, uh, I think it would be nice to discuss a little bit what are the sufficient conditions in this environment in order to ensure monotonicity of the labor allocation rule. In the one dimension, so this is very standard in the literature, most of the papers with optimal tax with multi-sectors do not uh, discuss this in detail. I think in the one-dimensional case, we understand this very well. We know that when monotonicity cannot be ensured, we're going to have bunching. And we know under what conditions of the distribution we can ensure monotonicity. However, in this problem, this is more complicated. So first, it would be nice to know whether the monotonicity of the endogenous distribution of our types at the optimal threshold level is, is it sufficient to ensure monotonicity of the labor allocation rule. And second, what are the assumptions over the primitive distributions that allows us to say that the endogenous distribution is going to satisfy this monotone hazard rate condition or whatever is the relevant condition that, that's necessary to ensure monotonicity. That'll be all. Thank you, Alessandro. No? Uh, you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot, actually. It's, uh, oops, this work. Um, fantastic comments. I, uh, I appreciate all of them. Um, so uh, maybe, let me just uh, maybe go back uh, by one slide, if it is possible, so that I, I just use the list uh, to reply. Uh, if it's not too difficult, otherwise I can say it doesn't matter. OK. So, um, these are very, very pertinent uh, uh, issues, the one that Victor is, uh, is pointing to. Um, let me start maybe you know, from the bottom and moving up. Um, how to guarantee monotonicity of labor allocation? Uh, that's a very good question, and uh, that's needed uh, for incentive compatibility. Uh, for some of the results, going back to what Umberto was also asking before, actually, it's not quite my business. So that I'm, uh, you know, I start with something that is deemed to be incentive compatible, so it has to satisfy all this property, and I just uh, envision a perturbation of that to preserve incentive compatibility. So, optimality here is identified and not really working with primitives. So, in that respect, I perfectly agree with Victor that, uh, you know, the paper is not operationally useful to the sense of telling you exactly in the end of the day how to design the task code because it doesn't tell you exactly what type of things uh, guarantee the incentive compatibility that you want or not. It's just uh, it's designed to uncover the suboptimality of uh, the uh, Diamond and, uh, and Merlis environment. So you start with something that it better be incentive compatible. I envision a perturbation that preserves it, it does better. So unless your initial uh, uh, policy is uh, uh, such that uh, it has uh, embedded into it uh, production efficiency, generically, I can do better. But I agree that it would be nice uh, to know more generally what primitive conditions uh, do the job of guaranteeing uh, the monotonicity, which one we don't. You may need to, to do this uh, reverse engineering of finding the primitive condition. I, I agree. Then uh, uh, sector independent income taxes, uh, so both of these examples of the Victor consider are very illuminative actually and I definitely wanted to expand on uh, in the paper based on, uh, on the suggestion. The one where uh, people are constrained to join one of the two sectors and uh, you're constrained to use uniform income taxes and the only thing you can play with is sales taxes is very interesting but unfortunately doesn't permit you to establish the optimality of uh, production efficiency. Simply because, uh, you know, there, you know, in this economy, the only way production efficiency could, uh, could be established is by having people suboptimally being allocated to the different sectors. It's uh, crucial for that, that they can endogenously sort for themselves uh, between the two occupations. So, if, so actually, what you describe is what is Niato's paper. So Niato's paper, you know, he highlighted that, uh, you know, essentially, if, uh, you know, people cannot really decide whether to become skilled or unskilled, then uh, actually you, know, you may need to use uh, sales taxes. You may also have uh, uh, distortions in how much of a 
you know, how much of a work we provide within each sector, but this is not our definition of production efficiency. Uh, the other one, that the other exercise you propose is very useful, the one um, with uh, essentially, you know, a degenerate uh, sector. In one sector you know exactly how productive agents are, and the other, you know, you don't, that leads to this, uh, you know, very simple uh, vertical uh, cutoff uh, uh, function, and actually it's, it's good. Actually, it, it's, uh, it, it highlights some of the key forces in a simplified manner, so I like it a lot. I'm going to, you know, if you permit me, I'm going to exploit it in the paper. Um, the, the one, uh, the other thing that you ask is um, properties of F that permit you to determine uh, which sector will be favored. Uh, we tried a little bit of that, and uh, we generically fail. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that such a thing exists, but. Uh, uh, it fails within the set of things we tried. So that's my definition of generic. So it's not scientific. Um, it's very hard. Uh, uh, except in special cases where you, know, you can really tell uh, you know, what properties of the distribution of joint productivities induce the government to, fa to favor one sector over the other one. Um, we tried, for example, the other rate order. We thought actually maybe that was the answer. It's not. Um, this doesn't mean much, it simply points it to the limitation of the authors, uh, but I, I, I perfectly agree that uh, it's a natural thing to ask. Uh, we couldn't find anything illuminated at the moment, that's why we didn't include it in the paper, but it's, uh, it's a very legitimate thing to do.